Sophie Ellis Baxter. What a delight it is to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here with you. And I mean, you are well known. You're a, a songwriter, a musician, a podcaster, a mother of five boys. Any other roles? It's just nice to be sat here in this quiet space with you, <laughs> sitting down. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, my day job is singing, really. And there's other little satellites off that, but music's at the heart of it. And yeah, family life is part of who I am as well. <laughs> and, and the music that is at the heart of it and is at the heart of you, what is the connection between music and your heart? How is it you? I don't know if everybody feels like this, but I feel like the, the kernel of who I am and what excites me hasn't really shifted massively over the years. And when I say over the years, I mean probably since I was about seven or eight. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, that so Jesuit I'm, thing. Yeah, I feel a little bit seven. like, it, you know, if you were to cut me in half, you'd get like the rings, like the tree, but the essence of it is kind of the same, I think. And music has always been this incredible portal. It's like a time portal, isn't it? So... I feel like I'm very lucky because the thing I do for a living can connect to me with, I mean, if I think about it, it's probably like a version of me crystallized around 17. <laughs> so it's it's like a massively important part of keeping me calibrated, actually, because it gives me a bit of escape and catharsis. And then obviously I can share it with, you know, either professionally or at home, but it actually is quite, at the heart of it, it's quite selfish that it's there too. And it feels kind of deeply intimate. I mean, the thing I love, psychologically about music is that it can transport us it can Absolutely. take us like you say you can hear a song that you listened to when you were 17 and you're back in your mum's kitchen yeah as a 17 year old girl or or your first date or when you had a child and so that they hold songs hold emotional memories they do and I think it's an art form unlike a lot of others because you might have a your yeah, first dance at your wedding, you might have music you want played at your funeral, there might be a song you associate with, you know, even giving birth, people sometimes produce, you know, soundtracks. So I think music is something that can be transported that way. And I feel very lucky that in my work, I get to sometimes have provided a soundtrack to someone's, you know, to a really big moment in their life. Like that's a privilege, isn't it? It's an incredible privilege that you're part of their story of the way you know so when you see when people like George Michael die or mm. big stars David Bowie John mm. Lennon people have a real relationship with the with their musical idols don't they yeah have you ever thought that people have that relationship with you um it's not I'm not very good at thinking about myself as a sort of third person like that but I do think that music can say things that sometimes we feel is a private thought and then you hear a song on the radio and you think, oh, I didn't realise someone else. And I remember when I had my heart broken the first time and all the songs about heartache, it was like, well, is it, have they always been here? <laughs> they suddenly are speaking directly to me. How did they know how I'd feel right now? Like, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and that is the gift of music, that often we can't find words or we have no way of almost even knowing what we feel. But there's something about the combination of sound, of the music, the lyric, the expression, mm. the tone of the voice that gets under our hoods, that gets yeah. to us in a way that nothing else That's can. That's very true. Yeah, I love that about it. <laughs> so thinking about you and your challenges, which is, the, is um, always what I ask my guests, mm. is there a particular challenge you are facing or have faced? You, I mean, you come across so cheerful and like it kind of really joyous in yourself and within the joy I'm sure there are things that are difficult yes of course I mean yes I suppose overall I do think I, I I live a very happy life and I also have quite a my mum was always someone I could turn to when I was little about anything and I think she handed me a lot of the sort of pragmatism. And so sometimes if I'm faced with challenges, I I think I, generally speaking, I'm quite good at being able to work out a narrative that can support me through it until I believe, until that becomes a truth. It's not always the truth at the beginning, but if something's not gone the way I want or if something's making me feel, you know, 
heavy for whatever reason, I can usually find a way to frame it to to give me enough to keep, you know, one foot moving in front of the other. And I think that's something that, yeah, you, I think you can maybe be born a little bit with that, but I think you can also learn it as a bit of a skill. Um, Reframing what is first a really negative, like... Exactly. I don't know, being dropped by your label when you were young. Yes, exactly that. Um, and of course, when you're in the middle of it, it can feel very Rejecting isolating. And... Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, to be honest, um, I often credit the fact... So I was signed in a record deal before I finished my A-levels, so... Incredibly young. Well, looking back, yeah, but of course I didn't feel that at the time. I was in such a hurry to get going. I'd started singing at 16. Um, I mean, my parents were very tolerant, really, because I was actually fairly engaged in school until GCSE, and then the wheels came off completely at my <laughs> level. There was suddenly a whole world out there. Music, boys, yeah, it was all very exciting. And so I signed a record deal when I had my 18th birthday. Wow. Because the people I was in a band with were older than me and they used my 18th birthday as a milestone moment to, to to choose what label we would sign to because if I'd signed before that, then I would have had to have my parents co-sign the contract. So 18, I was able to sign it by myself. So they used this as a sort of line in the sand. Like, and so we literally did a gig at a place called The Borderline, a um, little music venue in central London. And it was like, at mi as midnight struck, I was went on stage and we announced who we would sign to as wow. I was officially, legally 18 then. It's kind of crazy looking back, but so obviously if you sign a deal in sort of, my birthday's April, we signed, I think, May. I sat my A-levels in June, but my head was pretty turned. Went off on tour. We were really hyped. And then by the time I was 20, uh, we'd been dropped. It was all, all coming to a close. And So it kind of peaked. Yeah. And then crashed. It was, yeah, a little four-year period of the highs and the lows of what music industry can be like, I guess. But I learned so much, and even though I wouldn't wish it on anyone, it did form the foundation of kind of everything that followed since then. And I think the fact that I've taken what I do, sort of seized it with both hands, and I don't take any of it for granted, is because I do know what it feels like when you get really excited and it still all goes away. So, yeah, in a way, it was really good for me. I, I probably would have been really ghastly as well, I think, if it had just all rolled. I think I would have been really unpleasant to be around. It's <laughs> given you a humility, like a kind of... Yeah, which I probably needed, really. Because, <laughs> I mean, you, have you got a child that's 18? I've got a child that's 20. My oldest is 20. Next one down is 15, then 12, 8 and 5. It's a spectrum there, isn't there? <laughs> you are going through those school doors yeah. forever. School and all the stuff that comes with it. I mean, I I quite like the juxtaposition of it. My eldest had his first driving lesson the same week my youngest started nursery. And I like the fact you can have these very different milestones happening simultaneous. And actually, Sonny, my eldest, is a very good biggest brother because they all look up to him so much. And sometimes when you're going through the teenage years and I'm just one voice in many. I can say to Sonny, oh, can you speak to your young brother about this? I'm worried about X, Y, Z. And he can be really brilliant at sort of sitting with them and and being a wise voice that they listen to if they won't always listen to mine. <laughs> that is a lovely... And also peer influence is much greater in siblings than, than your influence. And I was thinking when you look at your 20-year-old son and then you think of your years of when you were 18, 19, 20, mm. 21... Can you see, because often what adults or parents are saying now is our children are so much slower than us to mature. You know, mm. by the time I was 20, I was this, that and the other. But that doesn't sound like your experience with your kids. Um, I think Sonny's just a very, he's just a different person. And I was always in a hurry and I'm not sure that's always been a brilliant characteristic, really. I think I just was sort of living in slight fast forward. I felt like they, I just wanted to get through, you know, big things as quick as possible. So like, for example, as soon as I turned 18, I could not wait to move out. I was gone. <laughs> I was literally, I think I finished school and then like the week later I was bags packed off. I just wanted to be out in the world. Uh, I don't think Sonny's the same like that. What was that about, wanting uh, in such a hurry? Combination of gone? things. I think I had much younger siblings in the house with me at home, which is obviously... The tone of a house is quite set by the 
youngest members, I think. So having, so my sister then, if I was 18, she would have been seven, my brother would have been 10. So they're still at primary school. So that school. was modelled for you, having a big age gap. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, what you repeat? All the wow, same. <laughs> I hadn't clocked that. Yeah, I'm actually, in some ways, I'm not very adventurous at all. I also live about 10 minutes from where my mum is now as well. I mean, some things I've done in big, bold brushstrokes and other things I'm actually like very, very small with it. You know, the foundation bits are very cosy. Um, How lovely. I like it and it keeps, it's very important to me to have that touchstone and possibly as well a little bit you know as we we're talking before about when things don't go to plan and I I sort of observed I don't know if it's necessarily true but I think so that when people experience success particularly their first rush you've got two sort of approaches you either don't really change very much at all so that if it all gets dismantled nothing much has shifted or I remember watching you know, big pop stars. So this would be like late 90s, early noughties, and they would have security with them and the flashy sunglasses. And it would be very conspicuous, you know, their lifestyle. But to me, all those trappings were being put around them because it's reassuring. Because the more scaffolding you put in place, the more there is to dismantle. And it would probably feel reassuring to them in, in the opposite way. But to me, I was always, the, I wanted less fuss. Because then if it all goes south, there's very much less that has to shift. I have to just deal with the emotional fallout rather than actual practical change in my day-to-day -day life. And I think that's probably the reason why I live how I live. I like things that are um, yeah, provide me a good anchor, that are familiar, touchstones, and hopefully, ultimately, that keep the compass the right way up in terms of what the, the really important stuff is. You know, being near my family, spending time with them, I don't really like a lot of fuss around the edges, actually. I mean, what I get from what you're saying, which is is sort of heartwarming, is that your relationship with fame, with being a pop star, with the music industry, which is a kind of incredibly volatile, unpredictable, but also very thrilling and can change one's relationship with oneself, you've held on to your core values that you got from your mum that, you know, work hard. But what really matters is love at the end of the day, is the relationships that are at the heart of your life. I think that's true. And, you know, not just my mum, my dad too, and In siblings. Dad. But I don't think I've done that by myself. I think that I was fortunate because my parents uh, both worked in television. So even though music was a slightly different world to them. I never had any of my family turn into my fans at any point. I mean, don't get me wrong, sometimes it could have actually been quite nice. But, <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, it's not actually really what you want. No. You don't want starstruck relatives. I think that's, that's very unhealthy and a big thing to navigate, actually. So that's never been a, a question mark, really. They've always kept their concerns for me relative to probably any parent, any kid who's doing any job, really, and looked at, like, was I emotionally stable, financially stable, is there anything we need to worry about here? And then the rest of it can sort of fall into place. So I think that helped me a lot. And, I mean, when you speak about challenges, I am very aware of the fact that I have not had nearly as many as some people have. I mean, you know, to go from having parents that worked in the entertainment business that ended up being in music, it's not like wow, how did you make that leap? I've been very, I've had a lot of real advantages. Also growing up in London, I was in the place where there were there were gigs, there were venues, there were musicians, there were a &R people were going out to venues to, to find new talent. Like all of that. Was on your side. Yeah, massively, massively. I always think about that when I think about, the, you know, the talent shows because people can be a bit snooty about them, but I am so not like that at all. I think if you're, like, you know, someone who's, thinking big dreams about something you love to do and the show comes to town and offers you a way to do it like I've, I would definitely I would have been in that queue too 100% I love the idea of you being in that queue <laughs> I would, would you like quite to be a judge? no I would not like to be a judge no I I really love to support people and I'm always open to talking to new musicians and new artists and quite frequently if I'm a festival, I'll go and watch all the acts on early day and just see people and chat to them. I, I love be, being that kind of, you know, I'm here, here for a little bit of advice, but 
The mentoring. judge thing, I think, yeah, mentoring, I think, is really important. But the judge thing, I'm not sure about really, because I feel like TV always comes first in those equations. Telly's, you know, it's all about entertainment. So there's everybody's kind of got their role to play, and I don't know if I want to sit there going behind the table. They're like, would you like my fabulous life? You know, I just, it's not really, it's not really it's my not vibe. Really. Nah. So from your podcast, Spinning Plates, mm-hmm. The assumption I've made is that for you, the juggle of being a parent to five boys with a big range, mm-hmm. of working with your husband, and then being on tour and being away from home, which looks really exciting and thrilling. And it, I mean, I'd love to know what your experience is of being on stage, but also how you manage the going away, coming back, the sort of exit and entry. It, Yes. Well, I suppose first thing first, the podcast. So I think I started that because I wanted to talk to other working women who happen to be mothers about how they felt motherhood changed them. So yes, it's sort of the juggle, but really it's kind of an icebreaker. I'm actually also really curious to know about people's relationship with their work, because I think those conversations have helped give me more permission to do what I do. And it's funny, isn't it? Sometimes you embark on a project, not really know exactly why you're doing it. And as as it unfolds, it becomes more apparent. It was instinct that you kind of was good, but it gives you more wisdom than you even Definitely. Yeah, because I started it when I was just approaching 40 and I didn't really have an idea what 40 meant to me. And so I think it's partly that, like giving myself a little bit of a roadmap. But also maybe even though I'd been doing what I do for a long time by that point, I still diminished the role of work in my house. I wasn't very good at talking about work and I would always say to the kids, oh, I've just got this little thing I'm doing or I didn't really, oh, I don't want to be away from you for this. Or yeah, I, would, I would talk about it in small language. And actually that wasn't really helping any, any of us really. And so talking to other women who have formed their own relationship with how their prioritize work or were still navigating it helped me do the same. And so... As it happened, we then went into lockdown where obviously all the work dried up. And it was in that time that I realized that my diminished way of talking about it meant I actually also didn't have any space in the house that was for my work. Home was all about family. I didn't have anywhere I could go. It would always been going to work that gave me that headspace. Outside the door. Yes. So I suddenly, I I was craving a room, an actual literal one, just somewhere. Of course, that didn't exist. That's fine. But then when I came back to work and actually things started picking up momentum, when once we got back out and about, it, I had loads of work come in and it helped me set it up and explain to my kids better, actually, I'm going to take these opportunities and it really matters to me, which ultimately led to this year, possibly one of the busiest years I've ever had. And I've been able to navigate it much better because I can set it up to say, of course, I'll be missing you when I'm away, but this is why I'm doing it. And I know this is more than ever last. It doesn't. It's a chapter. But how wonderful that I've got all these adventures and I'm just going to go for it. And sometimes we, in, we involve them. We've taken the kids with us on some trips we would never have had had this year not fall, you know, gone the way it's had. And with how do I navigate trips? Yeah, it is still the, the hardest bit, I think. And it's timely we're speaking about it because I'm about to go away for a month. And I've never been away that long since I've had children. And... I'm going to bring them with me for the first five days and then they'll go home and I'll keep going. So I'll have just over three weeks, which if I heard someone else say, I'd be like, it's only three weeks. They're going to be fine, of course. But to me, it's a big thing and I'm going to be the other side of the world. For some of it, I'm going to be Australia. Wow. But I love what I do. It will pass by. I'm making plans for them. I'm at the always available at the end of the phone. I mean, when I was in America, my... So my 12-year-old started year seven last year and was struggling, not struggling, settling into a new school. And he had to move school, poor thing, halfway through. And um, I just was getting up at 3.30, 4 in the morning to FaceTime him going into school every day. And I'm just like, if that's what I do, that's what I do. So I don't really mind. I'm just, I'm available, really. Yeah, I think I feel a bit better about it now than I did like two weeks ago because we sort of psychologically got prepped. It'll be all right, won't it? It will be all right. (laughs) Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's something that is very different between mothers and fathers. I mean, it's changing. Um, Yeah, it's changing-ish. Ish. Ish. I think the rhetoric around it is still very much 
on me about how how am I going to do it? Who's looking after the kids when I'm away? Sometimes in a weird way, when I'm going to Australia, I did a little interview last week with some radio DJs to talk about the, the tour coming up. And they said, oh, so you come in here for a little vac, hey? How'd you swing that? Say so to your husband, <laughs> you have the kids, I'm off. And I'm like, it's literally not a holiday. Apologies for a terrible <laughs> Australian accent. But I was like, it's not, I felt like some like very like old lady that I sort of said, I'm coming to work. I'm really yes. looking forward to it. But it's like, it's not like I'm lying there going like, woo, check me. I'm sunbathing every yeah. day. Yeah. But then again, you've got to find the adventure. And that's when it really, I think it makes a big difference that Richard tours with me because we get to enjoy it together. I cannot imagine what touring would look like if he wasn't with me. And actually, my little brother's also in my band. He's my drummer. So oh, wow. there's the three of us. I love my band. And it is quite once in a lifetime. I've done what I do long enough to know. You don't get this flurry, this momentum all the time. You've got to seize momentum. It's such a good bedfellow to being creative. So I'm kind of here for it, really. And how brilliant to be doing so much in a decade where I really didn't know what it would look like for me. Like, great. And was that thought burn that... Yeah, it's made a big difference. It, it's not everything I've been up to this year, but it's been this unexpected whirlwind, for sure. And the big thing that came out of salt burn, because essentially Murder on the Dance Floor had a resurgence as being part of that soundtrack, which is glorious, but... And you knew it was coming, but you had no idea what it would bring. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone can predict it, which is part of the glory of it. But it's a little bit like thinking you're getting on a carousel and it turns out to be a roller coaster. Like the beginning of the year was a bit... It, the momentum was just a bit much for me, actually, because I was quite happy, really, <laughs> with, the, with the predicted shape of my year. And suddenly it was all the gaps were just like being... Other things put in... And the big thing is America, because I'd never had a release in America in my whole life. I'd never done so wow. much as a radio interview. And Good now Lord. I've done two tours there. Wow. It's just bonkers, but really so, fun. So fun. I mean, what a fun thing. And let me tell you, people do react differently if you say you're going on tour in America. Everybody's like, oh, that's fun. That's <laughs> it's like just an got Oscar, glamour. right? It is amazing. It's, it's really fun. And the nice thing is, I think if this had happened first time around... I would have been thinking, okay, so I've done that. What happens next? I've not been asking that question. I just want to be in the here and now of it. If I only ever do all that once, great. I did all the stuff. I've done all the touristy things. But if it does lead to something, that's great. But that's really not been where my head's been at. So, so you're really in the moment. Yeah. Because I, I was sort of thinking about me as, you know, I've been a working mother my whole I've never had to tour. But I've always felt this real tension Oh, it isn't actually, I don't feel so much guilt. It's like my battle with time. Mm. So I legitimize the job I do and I give myself permission for that because I know that as a human being, I would not be any kind of decent mother if I didn't have something else that was completely different. Mm. But I look at time like, work somehow steals time from home. And I can't, sh I mean, I know my children have grown up and I've got grandchildren, but I still have that thing of trying to squeeze less time but do more. Mm. I, I don't know if that rings a bell. Yeah, sometimes almost like a, a sort of comedy effect, really, where I feel <laughs> like I'm trying to do all these bits and it's like, great, we squeeze that, great. And it's like, take the picture, do the thing. Yep, yeah, that's done, right, great. Now on to the next thing. And yeah, sometimes it's been absurd. And I suppose especially because my work is not predictable. I, I very rarely start a new year knowing what that year will look like. Gosh. Uh, quite frequently, you'll start January not really knowing. So, for, for example, last September, um, I had quite a big, like, the wheel turning moment. My 20-year-old started a foundation at uni. My 15-year-old started GCSEs. My 12-year-old started secondary. My little one started reception it was only the, the now eight-year-old who was just the same school, nothing changed. <laughs> I also, all four children moved bedrooms. One moved out, three moved into different bedrooms. Then January, everything's kicking off with Saltburn. Brilliant, exciting. And I get an email <laughs> the second week of January that the secondary school where two of them are at, one of them only one time in, is going to close at the end of the school year. So I'm then looking for a new school. So within the space of a year, four new bedrooms... Four kids changing school, Jeez. two of them twice. And that was really pushing me a bit. I would not yeah. have done it if I'd known. 
So, of course, for each child, that's their own experience of life. They're not thinking about what their brothers are up to in that moment. That's their whole world. So, yeah, there was a bit of it where, you know, it's all sort of moving furnitures and flat packs and trying to make, oh, let's make this room into your room. Quick, yay, brr, let's quick do that. And then you're also, wait, we're going to look at a school and I haven't forgotten about that. And I think there's also an expectation on parents to be across so many things about logging in and how they keep you on top of their homework the and the, WhatsApp uh, groups. Oh, it can parents. drive you absolutely nuts. Sometimes you just need to take a breath, don't you? And just be forgiving of certain things, let things go. It's Yeah, it definitely made me feel like I was clinging on. There was actually quite a comedic bit and it is going to sound like a, a massive like name drop, but I promise you it's relevant. But around that time... I got a phone call from Elton John, and Elton calls sometimes when something big is happening. And it's always a bit of a, oh, unknown call, I'll pick up, oh, hello, Elton. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's quite funny, but lovely. It's really amazing. He's really across those things. But he rang me to say, congratulations on murder with Saltburn. And instead, I found myself telling him about this school closure. <laughs> he must have thought, how quickly can I get off the phone? Because this is not a conversation. But it was obviously so much at the top of my brain I just couldn't help but bring it up. You know, when you're going through yeah, things and things just pop out. That's in the front. Yes. And I think uh. he's godfather to Emerald Fernand, isn't he? Who wrote Saltburn. Oh, well, that would be... I probably didn't even give him time to share that. <laughs> <laughs> he's too... Oh, sorry, I think my doorbell's ring. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really... Um, I think I hoped you would say, oh, I'll set up a school for you. Oh, <laughs> let me solve it. <laughs> Which, uh, no, I mean, I'll... We got there in the end. In the here and now, just thinking, oh, that's another thing I've got to organise. I think, yeah, by and large, things could be worse, right? And I kept thinking, so long as everybody's well and happy, fundamentally, I can kind of get through anything, really. And there must have been a part of you that wanted chaos if you were going to have five kids. Yeah, you're right. I did kind of invite it, didn't I? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think sometimes that you do things without really realizing exactly what you do. I was just really like so enthusiastic. And then as they get bigger, they, it's not just literal space, but I feel like that every, like everything is Psychological. Yes, yeah. definitely. But then again, when I had my fifth, I was 39. My eldest was 14. I felt like I was going into having that baby in a more sober way. No, it's still very more joyful. Mature. Yeah, I was just very eyes wide open. It'll be a baby now, but all of that will happen. Whereas when you have your first, you're so fixated on who Getting is this through little the first bit. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I do like the chaos of it. I do. And I find it funny and warm. And at the moment, I would say no matter how many pulls there are on my time, I'm not finding the kids stressful or anything. I've been home for the best part of about a month at the moment. I've really, really loved it. Yeah, it's felt really good. And are they cross with you when you come home? Are they, you know, that thing of re-entry, like turning away from you no it's more sometimes they've just more been a bit exasperated because they always have had travel but this year has been an unusually a large amount and solid blocks as well which i don't normally do i'll normally do very very quick turnarounds like glasto <laughs> yeah <A> weekend. <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah i this time i've had more time where it's like i came away for two weeks here or two weeks there that's quite unusual for the family and I think they've just felt a bit, again, you know, there's been a bit of that. A bit wear and tear. Yeah, and sometimes that is hard on me. I don't love it. I don't love leaving them. And sometimes you do feel like I shouldn't be away right now. But what's the flip? There's nothing else I can do. I need to earn a living if we're going to be nuts and bolts. But also it gives me something that I need. Like when you were describing how you feel with your work and needing that. I do think I'm a better mother for doing the work. And... And also when I'm on stage, I get to be so in the moment, everything else can fall away for a bit. And that is so precious. And I didn't really understand the role that that had until I wasn't working for that two years when we weren't gigging so much. And I was like, wow, I really did need that. I didn't understand what it was giving me. And the camaraderie and seeing people. The joy. And, yeah, and being part of something together. I really enjoy all that. Because I was trying to imagine what it is like going on stage in front of thousands of people who are cheering, you're dancing, you're kicking your great legs in the air, <laughs> in your glitter. And what is the sensation of that? What does that feel like? 
Well, I think if anything, it's the most sort of glorious it's been in the last sort of five years or so. I feel like my relationship with what I do has deepened. Actually, I think I always loved more it. More confident. Yeah, I think I spent a long time being the critic in the crowd, even if I'm the one on stage. I mean, especially Your when I was younger. Committee. Yes, I could, I could give a, a you know, a sort of blist, like a horrible review of pretty much any gig I've done. And I, that doesn't ever quite leave you because I care. You're observing and you're Yes, wanting. and I want, to, I want to be always getting better. I think there is a real, you know, stagecraft. Every time I watch people, I'm thinking, oh, I loved when they did this or that didn't work so well. I'm always learning. But I think that inhibition and just the joy of it, I, that's an unexpected treat I didn't even really used to wear anything that twinkly for a long time. That's only been relatively recent as well, I think. So, I mean, probably much to my kids' horror, really. And I, I didn't even, I never wore like a, a leotard and tinsel epaulets on stage <laughs> till I hit my mid 40s. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> you are killing it. <laughs> I really enjoy it. And it, it, I find it really empowering, actually. And I hope. It's I great do role hope. modeling for women. Too. I hope so. I Mother would love of that. Five. That would make me feel really Glitter, good. Glitter, legs. Because it's not picking. about. Because nothing's changed about the things that used to make me feel I couldn't do that. Nothing. It's it's only a shift in my mindset. You've changed so, internally. Yeah. I, when I first started, I wouldn't move at all. I was really still and nervous and trying to be cool. And you don't realize how much that's holding you back, do you? Till you till you lose it. Because uh, I was reading some research about awe, and there are eight domains that you can get awe. And awe is this kind of collective exper experience of, of sort of pure joy. And it can be mm. at a sunset, but there is one for where you're collectively together in unison doing something together. Mm. And it, I, there's a word for it. I, I can't remember it. Um, Sophie will remind me. Um, and concerts, music, that thing of being in this, like laughing is a moment of intimacy, S listening to music, singing along with someone in a huge space together mm. is multiplied by the number of people in it, the sensations, and that those are moments of awe. Wow. Well, that, I mean, that, that does make total sense. I mean, you asked me before about how it feels when you walk out. And actually, I do gigs of all shapes and sizes. So firstly, if you do walk out and you've got a crowd that are giving you this wonderful energy, I don't take it lightly. That's not like an everyday thing. It's special. So sometimes I will just take a minute to enjoy it. But usually that's quite near the end of the gig. And the beginning bit is just thinking, how do I maintain it? How do I the make energy. people feel? Yeah. And, and if it's a festival where you're likely to get those really epic crowds, then you think, okay, I've been given this window with them. How do I get them to stay? How do I make them to feel, you know, want to feel like they made the right decision to be with me? And how do I convert people? I like to try and look at everybody. Obviously, you can't literally, but I like feeling like I've really covered the ground, worked the stage. And hopefully, yeah, by the end, it's you sort of, um, how to describe it? I suppose it's like having I mean, conversation isn't quite the right word, but you are trying it's relational. to. relational. Yes, it is completely relational. And luckily, I quite like the challenge of it. And I think the gigs that have clarified it for me are not the ones where you've got the good stuff already, because that's like, oh, great. You know, if anything, if I'm just about to go out and I can see there's a really great crowd, I'll think, right. If I bugger this up, I'm crap at my job. <laughs> you know, like, come on, this has got to be special. Look at them. And sometimes you can tell if you're at a festival and they're clapping to whatever music is playing before you go on, you're like, oh, that's a great sign. They're pepped. But then if it's a crowd where they're not quite in the mood or if I have to do a charity event, you're quite often the bit, you'll be the, the turn when they've had the yeah. auction and they've been sat at their tables for a while and you'll think, right, how do I now take these people, I understand exactly how in. they feel, Mm. How do I get them to feel good about it? And actually, mostly what I'm trying to do is get them to relax about me because there's an inherent awkwardness in watching someone perform, particularly if they're performing in a quite a cold start. So I will try and show them as soon as possible, 
I'm fine. If you don't stand up, if you're still having your conversation, that is cool with me. You do whatever makes you feel good. I'm going to be in my own little world, happy. And that from that, you can normally get people to dance. It's a bit like if you see a comedian and they tell you you're not laughing enough. That's not going to work, is it? So you've got to let the crowd come to it the way it works for them. And I've sat, I've been the person on the receiving end of gigs plenty of times when I'm not in the mood. So I'm very sympathetic to that. But I'll still try and work it so that they end up dancing even if they didn't think they were going to. It's a challenge. I like it. But I reckon that can be translated into every aspect of life, right? Where you, if you're not putting pressure on the person opposite you to be other than who they are, but giving them permission to be their authentic selves, mm. and then you are being your authentic self in, I'm, you know, don't have to worry about me. Mm. I'm here to tell you, I'm here to ask you, I'm here to perform, automatically their defences drop. Well, I think that's true, definitely. Also, I just think it's like quite a decent way to be, really. You shouldn't have any expectation about the other person, should you? Because you'd have no idea what they're coming in from or what they're dealing with. So I think it's just kind of quite a sympathetic way to coexist with people. Because otherwise you start filling in gaps and... It, Ultimately, it's not really about me. I mean, it'd be much easier if it was, but no, a healthy way around is not that. So I think it's really important for my mental health, really, to remember the role that I play in other people's lives is just not that big a deal. Thank you very much. And when I go on tour, I'll often spend the whole day wandering around the city. And it's partly because I want to get a flavor and I like seeing new places. It also gives me a purposeful day. But it's also because I see so many things happening that are nothing to do with why I'm in town. And I like that. I don't want to feel like a big thing. I want to be a small thing because I can manage that much better. And even when I did like, I don't know, Strictly, which has got millions of, of viewers, viewers. But I would always remember that there's so many people where either, yes, it's on, but they're also having their supper and they're talking over it. Or there's more people not watching it than what, you know, otherwise it's very easy to let things become overwhelming. overwhelming yeah really big and scary and then that's much harder to tackle and i imagine you got that framing of humility and i'm small i'm not the whole thing also modeled by your parents who were in the entertainment business so that, that there must have been some dialogue that in some way got into your dna Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I can already think of conversations, particularly with my mum, I think, because she was a she presenter. She was huge. Yeah. She was big on Blue Peter. Yeah. And Blue I Peter remember at the her. time was big as well. It was a different era, you know, four channels. And that was the big kids TV program. So, I mean, I'd go home from school and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. If she got mobbed, it was like people my size, which was always quite funny, but well, not funny <laughs> at the time. I found it really annoying. But, um, but I think also, uh, Everything you do is just, like when I started Strictly and I was like, this is a massive deal. I'm only using it as an example because I've yeah. never really done anything that was quite so much of a juggernaut. It was very un unfamiliar. But my mum was like, look, for the rest of your life, this is just going to be a nice thing you did once. So just enjoy it. And actually, I, you do kind of cling on to things like that sometimes when you're feeling like, you know, you're encouraged Super to think scary. it's massive. Yeah, because it was absolutely terrifying. And also I've had things go wrong and then you have to find a way to be able to get over that too. So if everything's become a really big deal, then you're much more bruised by it, aren't you? But ultimately, things do happen. Gigs don't always go to plan. I've had live TV not go to plan, and that is horrible. But you do come out the other side. The world still turns. You know, would you want it to happen? No, but you then fear it less, don't you? Sometimes it's the fear of those things happening that can be the most restrictive. Maybe that's another reason why I'm more relaxed on stage now because sometimes it's not going to work out and you just have to be okay with that really. So your real learning, I mean, if we I take the kind of golden thread, is it that thing of kind of recognizing what you can't control, having control over what you can control, but also having the kind of reality test of what really matters? Like when you think to yourself, what really matters is that my kids are well or that the people so. I love get up every day. Yeah, all of that. 
And actually, when you're talking, I was realised it's not just family. Like the concentric circles go outward. About all my girlfriends, I've got a lot of very long relationships in my life from Godolphin days. Some of them, yeah. My best friends from Godolphin, actually. Um, yeah, so I met her when I was eleven. Amazing. Yeah, really nice. So I've got a few girlfriends from school, a few from early days of my work. I've got lots of different aged girlfriends as well. Uh, and I think I just, yeah, I just love hearing what's going on in their world and, you know, keeping a bit of perspective. And actually that is definitely my counsel for sure, is all those conversations. If I wasn't able to have the outlet of those conversations, I don't know if I'd be able to stay as sane. <laughs> I need it. We need those deep friendships where we can be really honest, mm. that, are, that are completely separate from partners, siblings. In some way, there's some openness that you can have with them that you can't have with family. With... Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that lovely shorthand as well. You can pick up where you left off and, and laughing about things. Yeah, I like having a good giggle. That's important. So through the challenges, through the joys, through where you are now and about to go off, what's the kind of learning that you're taking with you? What's the wisdom that you hold close? Oh, I was hoping you'd tell me. After you'd listen to me, can you decipher it for me, please? <laughs> what's the wisdom? Well, I suppose, actually, I think it's about having good people around you, really, probably. It's the, the main thing. And then I think even if you have a wobble about yourself, like sometimes I think I must be a half decent person because I think I have such amazing people around me. Like my girlfriends are lovely. Um, so that really helps. But yeah, I think it's I think it's good counsel. And I think that's one thing as you get older, you get better at cultivating that. I've definitely had to let go of some relationships that weren't benefiting me. And I think sometimes it doesn't feel very easy and sometimes you do lose something, but you gain more. And I think you don't, that's just part of growing up, isn't it? That's the wisdom of getting a bit older, isn't it? And I think it goes back as well to what you're talking about, time. Because if time is so precious, you're going to, you want to make sure that you're choosing it with all the people that really matter. Yeah. It's a shame you can't bend time a little more, but I do do my absolute best. I don't sleep very much if that helps. <laughs> You I love do. it, but I just don't sleep tons. But it's okay. It will, it, that'll happen. In Australia when I'm on my vacay. <laughs> <laughs> you must have wanted to punch that, DJ. <sighs> it was lazy, but um, maybe if you look on my Instagram and a couple of weeks of picture I'm in a beach, that might be a little bit of truth. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. No one said no cocktails, right? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a great time. I think so. Have some adventures. And uh, then, yeah, back home to the babies. Well, thank you, Sophie, for such honesty and kind of integrity of who you are. It's a real joy to meet you. Oh, and, same to you. What a nice a thing pleasure. to be able to have such a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Sophie and Emily. Very nice to see you. And talking about the lovely Sophie ellis Vexter, who, amongst an unbelievably busy schedule of going on tour all over the world, managed to come in and record the podcast with us. So I felt very grateful to her. And it was a really delightful conversation. I just wanted to know your thoughts. It was such a lovely conversation to listen to. And I think the thing that lots of things stuck with me, but but one thing I've been thinking about a lot, particularly this week, which for me has been a, a difficult week in various ways, I mean, nothing terrible, but just a more difficult week, is the sort of power of music and the power of singing to really access parts of ourselves that words don't. So I was, was feeling a bit down and I was listening. It was all very sort of stuck inside me. And then I just listened to some really sad music and there was a sort of release in me that sort of could access that part that felt very stuck. And I think she really spoke to the power of music and the power of singing to be able to really reach those parts that are kind of more inaccessible. More the limbic system, isn't it? The yes, like the system. limbic system. And exactly, because we were all at this trauma conference together know, a month ago. Um, mm. And Bessel van der Kolk writes and talks a lot about 
this, like the power of singing, the power of movement, how we are really born. We're not born able to talk, but we are born being in sync and we are born moving and we are born hearing and making sounds and that sort of mental illness and trauma in particular is is when you've really become out of sync and and one way to begin to kind of reintegrate yourself with your body and become more in sync is through movement and through singing it's something that is so sort of innate to us and and I think what happens to a lot of us myself included is that the sort of super ego critic (laughs) takes over in childhood where you decide or you get told like you are not good at music you can't sing you can't dance because you're not the best at it and therefore like this has definitely been my experience is to sort of inhibit yourself I was Um, banned from singing at school so was I it's terrible I think we said that before haven't we yeah I was made to mouth the words yeah me too in my primary school I was nine and I think the release of singing and the power of it and also what she talked about the sort of communal aspect of all these people coming together it must be amazing to be her and kind of really really feel that I think it can really sadness but also on the flip side incredible amounts of joy too and um, I think we should all probably most of us do it do it more The thing I got from the conference was also the synchronicity of movement and sound. So I have been, I mean, I always love dancing. I've always danced in the kitchen or in the bathroom or whatever, Mm. but I've sort of done it intentionally and kind of move my body with the music. And I've also listened to online to lots of people omming in different ways. And I've used that as a sleep meditation and it, I have to find it very, very soothing, I've got to say. And dancing and the moving, how's that? The dancing and the moving bit definitely gets the stops things being stuck in me. That thing of sensory motor where you take in something as a part of a wave and then you push it out with movement as the other side of the wave so that you have the full interaction. And I've done it in that way with that kind of thought in mind. And it re- gets rid of a lot of debris from the end of the day. So I do it as a kind of 10-minute practice. It's really fun. It doesn't look good. <laughs> I'm a massive keen person on dancing, as you both know. really love it. And for me, it can make me more euphoric more than anything else. Um, and I think the word you were looking for it was collective effervescence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you, that funny enough, when I was listening to it and you were like, so if you would know, I was like, I'd already named it out loud in the, when I had been listening to it. She means collective <laughs> effervescence. But also, if you look at indigenous communities or, you know, like when you look at Maori tribes when they do their war dances, it, knowing how to express your feelings through movement was a really normal part of cultural life. And actually, we just spend so much work these days, doesn't involve singing and dancing. It used to, you used to, farm singing songs so that you would do it in rhythm there was lots of ways where it was an integrated part of work life the army army always sing the army sing exactly marching Mm. Um, sing and march and and rhythm and beat and all that sort of thing um you know and co-regulation the synchronicity is so huge isn't it and the research that Bessel van der Kolk has looked at in drumming in Africa as a form of trauma treatment in the lives that we live now if you have to sort of curate it yourself and make it intentional and I I think that when you sort of talk about things like movement as therapy or singing as therapy it it sounds quite sort of woo-woo and like let's all sort of sit in a circle and do kumbaya Kumbaya. (laughs) yes whereas actually there's a lot of neuroscientific evidence to to back it up Um, but I think it can feel a bit new agey and like yeah. But we're wired to move and sing, right? We That's evolutionary in us, more than yeah. to sit and look at a computer, which we're not wired to do at all. Mm. We say as we sit and look at the computers. <laughs> one of my other thoughts was, I think it's one of the things that's often interesting, I think, of having our well-known guests um, is, I think, you know, in the kind of culture that we're in, we project a lot of otherness onto people who are very successful that they must have very different, maybe different problems and different lives. And there was so much that was relatable about the things that she needed to be in her life to be well, that is true for all of us, of like good relationships and a sort of rootedness and making sure you keep yourself safe. And I think that's always really valuable to kind of puncture that belief that at the core, most of us just need the same 
things. And I thought about when she was saying, oh, she's actually sort of, although her life has been very adventurous in lots of ways, she's also stayed very close to home. And that thing of sort of deep roots, big branches, that if you yeah, have so, really yeah. deep roots, if you have a really good center, then you actually, you can stretch much further and go much further out and stay whole and not break. I would agree with that. And also thinking about you and her mum in in terms of being you know, obviously there's a generational difference between you guys yes <laughs> but in a soft voice but also there's something about being female and kind of like coming into your power in in some ways a bit later in life where obviously she was very successful f- from really young but from what she was saying it sort of feels like she could sort of really own it and enjoy it and wear glitter and high heels and just appreciate it. it yeah in a way in her 40s that she couldn't do when she was in her teens and 20s um and i think there's something that's really um what's the word it's, role modeling um joyful yes. <laughs> i'm going to say joyful because it feels like it goes against lots of stereotypes which i think are changing around like women in middle age that feels very joyful and um also I think about this a lot as a mom and somebody who works is that the times where I sort of feel guilty because sometimes I'm thinking to myself I'm away from my children to see other people's children <laughs> is that a little bit crazy actually I also think it's, it's really important for me for my children and obviously different people have different personal identities and things that work for them but for me it's really important for my children to to see my work as having value and um that that is a role model in and of itself of of what it looks like to be a woman in the world that it's not just about meeting children's needs um it's also about having your own identity that's of value Mm. i remember a good friend of mine when she left university her dad took her aside she was going into her work career and he said to her don't forget to take yourself seriously and I just thought that was a really also particularly lovely from a father to a daughter to bridge that sort of gender thing and really stayed with me in fact that's a lovely thing to be passed on to you to be like take yourself seriously don't sort of undercut yourself or think you're not worthy of having a good career as well as a family or that you have something to offer in the world and that's a valuable thing yes and and even if your choice or where you are in life right now is that you are not working or you're not being paid to work Mm -hmm. you're looking after your children actually take yourself seriously in that regard too and recognize that's part of your identity even if it's what you are doing most of the day every day it is also not your entire identity (laughs) there are other parts of yourself that maybe don't get a lot of airtime, but are still of value. Yes. And that thing of taking yourself seriously and having more gravitas, it feels like a, a story of getting older that you hear, the positive version of the story of getting older, of gaining in confidence, realizing what really matters to you, caring less about what other people think. And one of my questions when I was listening to it was like, can you get it earlier? <laughs> like, is it just something <laughs> that comes with age? Is it something you can only really earn with experience and age? And you get to this point where you can just let go more. Or can you fast track it? I don't know if you could fast track parts of it, because I think part of it is is about being female as opposed to being male. I think there's an aspect of it that... I don't think, you know, she was talking about sort of diminishing her work and just saying, oh, I've got to do this little thing or I've got this tiny thing to do. And I I think in general, that is a more female Mm. thing to do Mm. still. So I think part of it is is about sort of societal changes and cultural changes and doing what she's doing, which is sort of modelling a different version of that. I think that's something that, that can change that could happen for younger generations. I often wondered, you know, there I was going out to work to kind of help other people or support other people and then brought the dregs home and not supporting you properly, which is a it's a terrible and I think lots of people feel it, you know, you Mm. take the best of yourself to work and you bring the worst home. The one thing that has really 
stood me in good stead, I think, from someone who wasn't confident kind of professionally and brought up very much the generation that you just get married and have children was that I wanted a professional identity that was very different from the rest of my life. And I always took that seriously, actually. I mean, I didn't always feel confident and I feel more confident So, But where do you think that came from then for you? I think it was instinctive and then became, you know, through therapy, I, I kind of recognised that I I really needed that for myself in order to manage all the other pulls and pushes of being a wife and a mother and um, the other identities that I held. And I think actually, funny enough for me, part of what's helped is is having a partner, my husband, who also takes what I do really seriously and is really proud and supportive and I think that helps me feel <laughs> like it's important. That it matters. Not, yeah. that, not necessarily that I need it from him, but it does help. Yeah. I think someone said once to me, the most feminist thing you can do is marry a supportive husband. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're talking about heterosexual couples here. But, um, yes. Or a supportive partner. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie, for being so kind of gloriously joyous and giving us your time and... Um, for such a lovely conversation and I think she is an inspiration for both being a mum, partner, performer in a way that is is really lovely and thank you both.